The American Revolution, Proclamation to Declaration to Constitution, 1763 to 1789. It's a basic orientation to the American Revolution. So, today's objectives will be to really provide an overview of the 26 years of the entire American Revolution, which I call from 1763 to 1789. We're going to be talking about the events that led to the war. We'll talk about the battles and events, of course, that, of course, that occurred during the war. And we'll talk about the actions that shaped the creation of the United States after the war years. With all of my talks, I try to integrate history, civics, world geography, economics, science, and historic preservation whenever I can. So, the story really begins when France was defeated and humiliated in a worldwide war with Great Britain. If you can look at that map, you'll see on the left, you'll see that France controlled most of North America at the time, before 1763. England, Great Britain, challenged France for control of North America. And once that war was over, we called it the French and Indian War here in America. It was a seven years war in Europe and around the world. Once that war was over, as you can see, uh, France yielded almost all of North America to England. In fact, uh, there's a proclamation line there of 1763 where you see that the current colonies, the 13 colonies with which we're going to be talking about, were carved out basically along that eastern seaboard. Uh, Spain actually, uh, France actually ceded to Spain the lands west of Mississippi. The Treaty of Paris really ended the French and Indian War or the Seven Years' War, and the British Parliament really issued a proclamation of 1763 along the Appalachian Mountains. Basically, they said you cannot expand west. They wanted to carve out that area between the Appalachians and the Mississippi River as really an Indian reserve. Um, the war was very expensive and also involved a lot of Native American tribes, and the British government simply did not want to spend any more money stationing troops over here in the North American area in order to protect settlers who wanted to cross over the mountains. So they did their best to try to be able to fence that area off between the Appalachians and the Mississippi and keep it free, basically, uh, for the Indians so that they would basically uh, quell any Indian uprisings or discontent because of Americans moving across the mountains. The British needed to raise funds. The war was very expensive worldwide and among all their colonies, not just over here, but around the world. And they needed to administer new lands that they had conquered from the French and also support troops that they needed to station at these areas. And above all, they needed to retire the war debt and continue to control the trade among all of their colonies. These are just a portion, a major portion of, of the major acts that were involved. I'm not going to go into detail of each of them, but some of them are pretty significant. I'll just highlight a few of them. For example, the navigation acts that you see at the very top there were really crucial because all the colonies could not trade directly with other nations around the world. They basically were in a position where they had to really use British ships and British crews and get their prices approved on their goods by the British government, which was very, very cumbersome. And of course, that eliminated a lot of the profit that some of the colonies had hoped to make. Also, the Stamp Act, of course, was a tax. It was a lot of a luxury tax, really, on playing cards, legal papers, diplomas, licenses, and newspapers. It was more of an annoyance than it was anything, but it was enough to upset a lot of the colonists. The Townsend Acts, really, really key because it really placed duties or basically taxes on glass and lead and paint and tea. It was eventually repealed, but it caused a, caused a lot of consternation during that time period. Now, the Tea Act is another interesting act because we've been led to believe since the time we were very, very young that the British placed a huge tax on tea and we colonists didn't like that, so we threw the tea overboard. That is not true. Uh, we'll be debunking a few myths like that during the course of this talk. The tea actually, uh, the, it was actually uh, an effort to basically reduce the massive surplus of tea that was held by the British East India Company. So what their mission was, was to really lower the price of that tea. Quality tea, rock bottom prices, because they wanted to put American smugglers out of business. That was the key of that particular act. Also, the Quebec Act extended the boundaries of Canada, of Quebec province, all the way down into the Ohio Valley. 
the British recognized that people like Daniel Boone and others were crossing the Appalachians into the Indian Reserve, violating the Proclamation of 1763, and as almost a last ditch attempt to try to persuade people to go back across the mountains where they came from, they enacted the Quebec Act, which extended the Catholic boundaries of the Catholic province all the way down into the Ohio Valley. Remember, most of the colonies were all Protestant, and it was an affront to them to say that if they crossed over and they committed any crimes, they would be tried by a Catholic court from the province of Quebec. Now, because I mentioned that the, the uh, British East India Company lowered that tax, obviously the colonists were very, very upset because nobody wanted to be put out of business if they had a thriving smuggling business. John Hancock was not only one of the most successful businessmen in America, but he was a very, very wealthy smuggler. He actually worked with the British and he worked with the colonists in terms of smuggling. So the colonists did dump the tea overboard to protect basically to protest the crackdown on American smuggling. And this is one of the oldest prints that you can find. Contrary to what people believe today is that they did not sh throw the chests of tea over. The uh, colonists disguised as Native Americans boarded the, that ship and they cut open basically the chests of tea and they discarded the tea in the water. Uh, they left the chests basically on board. So in response to that Boston Tea Party, and by the way, there were tea parties in other areas. There were some here in Virginia as well. Um, the British Parliament enacted the coercive, or what we would call the intolerable acts, passed in response to that particular revolt. One of the major things they did is shut down the port of Boston until the tea would be paid for. Probably the most brutal of all the acts was the Massachusetts Government Act, where they really revoked the Massachusetts Charter of 1691, a long-standing charter that gave basically self-government to those citizens in Massachusetts. They limited the authority of people that were governing. In fact, they said that only someone appointed by the king or the royal governor would actually be a legitimate representative of the people. They also began quartering troops as they brought more troops over in areas that were akin to public homes. Now, this had a tremendous adverse reaction throughout the colonies uh, to this particular thing. Patrick Henry here in Virginia really raged against the acts time and time again. So the first Continental Congress representing most of the colonies, not all of them, but a large percentage of them, met in Carpenter's Hall in Philadelphia, the first meeting of the Continental Congress, to address these concerns. They argued, they debated, they cajoled each other. Basically what they came up with was basically a olive branch petition to the king. They didn't hold the king responsible for Parliament's actions, but the king didn't even read the olive branch petition and basically declared eventually the colonies in a state of rebellion. General Thomas Gage was sent over here to replace Thomas Hutchison, who was the governor of the royal governor in Massachusetts, and he was a military governor. So, as it turns out, Gage decided to take matters into his own hands and seized the gunpowder magazines from the colonists at Worcester as well as at Concord. So, troops marched out on the morning of April 19, 1775. They were also warned by multiple writers, over 25 or more writers were out that night. It wasn't just Paul Revere. Uh, Longfellow's poem cites Paul Revere and Paul Revere's ride as being the sole writer. But we know through research and historical documentation that there were many, many, many writers out that night, all sent by Dr. Joseph Warren, one of the unsung heroes of the American Revolution. As it turns out, over 4,000 patriots showed up the next day. Uh, at Lexington, when the troops arrived in Lexington, uh, they met our militia. As we understand it, the militia were beginning to disperse, but nevertheless, somebody fired a weapon. We don't know where it came from, but in fact, a volley occurred, and eight members of our militia, our American militia, were killed, uh, or as well as others were wounded. And so the British troops, without any apologies, continued to move on up to Concord to seize the gunpowder magazine. Now, when you cross Concord Bridge, North Concord Bridge, uh, the powder magazine is within a couple hundred yards away from that. They never got there. Basically, American militia were there on the bridge. Volleys occurred between both sides. Multiple people were killed on both sides. And in fact, that's where the shot heard round the world occurred because that was the formal uh, indication of war between the colonies and Great Britain. Now, the Continental Congress met again. This time, they're convening for war. They have to raise uh, men. They have to basically uh, raise armies 
uh, train troops uh, have uh, supplies, ammunition, foodstuffs, medicine, those types of things, because we are at war and we have to protect ourselves. And so they meet at the Pennsylvania State House, in it, which we commonly refer to as Independence Hall in Philadelphia today. And that very same day, a, a colonel from Connecticut, uh, Benedict Arnold, and a basically uh, a, a leader of local men of the Green Mountain Boys, Ethan Allen, worked together to seize Fort Ticonderoga. If you're in need of arms and ammunition and tents and uniforms and those types of things, particularly arms and ammunition, you have to go to a place that has it. So they decided to attack Fort Ticonderoga off of Lake Champlain in what was one of the first offensive actions of the entire war. That occurred on the same day that the Continental Congress, the Second Continental Congress, met. Now, during the next several weeks, the American patriots decided to build fortifications on Breed's Hill. There was no battle on Bunker Hill, it was on Breed's Hill. Uh, Bunker Hill actually would have been a better strategic location, but for some reason the colonists decide to move down the hill and build hastily some fortifications and a redoubt, uh, which is a mini fort at the bottom, uh, at the midsize of that, that hill, and it was much more difficult to defend it, but that's where the battle was. Uh, we challenged the British to attack. They did. They attacked, in fact, three straight times on the third try, we ran out of ammunition on the American side and vacated the hill. Dr. Joseph Warren that you see in the picture there and Don Troiani's wonderful painting there is, uh, is to the right of the gentleman in blue. Here he is. He's a doctor. He decided he was actually uh, accorded the office of being a major general, but he declined. He decided to serve with his troops, and in fact, he was a private in that particular battle. He was there at the very end as part of the rear guard and trying to buy time for the Patriots to get away since they were out of ammunition, and he died at the Battle of Breed's Hill. Uh, it was a costly battle for the British. They lost over, over a thousand men were killed, wounded, or captured at that particular battle. Now, the colonies were, the royal governors were having problems with us rebels in all the colonies, and here in Virginia, Lord Dunmore, John Murray, uh, in fact, issued a proclamation on November 7th uh, that basically proclaimed that all enslaved individuals of rebels were in fact free. And several, several thousand left uh, their plantations and joined with the Royal Ethiopian Regiment that Lord Dunmore put together. And in fact, right down the road here at the Great Bridge, they had a major battle. We called it our Lexington and Concord of the South. But in fact, what happened was that they were in the, they were in the reserve unit. Uh, we don't know that they had any action, but we think this is what they particularly wore during, at that time, liberty or slaves. Meanwhile, American commanders Richard Montgomery and Benedict Arnold and Daniel Morgan led a force up to Canada to try to capture the main headquarters up there at Quebec and bring Canada in as the 14th colony to join the rebellion. That was a complete disaster. It occurred on uh, December 31st, 1775, in the middle of a snowstorm. The route that Montgomery took was on the left there, uh, basically up the St. Lawrence River to uh, Montreal, and then eventually to Quebec. He was killed in the first blast of cannon fire. Um, General Benedict Arnold, excuse me, Colonel Benedict Arnold was wounded in the left leg, uh, but recovered, and Daniel Morgan was basically taken prisoner and held as a prisoner of war until he was later exchanged about 18 months later. So that was a miserable failure in trying to invade Quebec and bring Canada in as a 14th colony. Now, in early 1776, in January, Thomas Paine's publication, Common Sense, basically called for Americans to rebel against Great Britain, set up a government that consisted of an executive branch, a legislative branch, and a judicial branch. And in fact, Thomas Paine advocated war against Britain, but he said, England is not going to take this lying down. In fact, they're going to respond, and they're going to respond heavily. So be prepared. And in fact, this publication, which call, was a call to arms, basically, of rebellion, uh, was sold basically by thousands and thousands of people bought this publication. George Mason, in June of 1776, authored the Declaration of Rights, which said all men by nature are free and independent. Because of the language that was involved there, uh, Thomas Jefferson, who's largely responsible for writing the Declaration of Independence, cooperated with Benjamin Franklin, 
as well as John Adams in writing our Declaration of Independence, where 13 separate colonies, or if you will, nation states, declared their independence from Great Britain on July 2nd, not July 4th, but July 2nd. July 2nd, they actually formally voted to declare their independence from Great Britain. It was on the 4th that, in fact, the publication of the broadside of the Declaration actually appeared in public, but they actually voted uh, for the independence on July 2nd. Now, the Declaration of Independence says that all men are created equal. We acknowledge that today. However, the Declaration of Independence uh, also, really, not everyone was included in that all men are created equal. In fact, Native Americans were, were fa weren't even factored into it to have any rights as Americans. They were savages. Uh, colonial women were also denied these natural rights as well. They didn't get their vote until until later on in the, in the early uh, 1900s, in 1919, with the suffrage movement. And although uh, slavery existed in all the colonies, southern plantations in particular were worried about uh, a slave uprising or insurrection, and they, in fact, kept people very close to their plantations. So rights were denied to all those individuals at that particular point in time. Now, the British knew that when we were basically declaring our independence, that they, they knew that we were going to do this, and as a result, they were going to basically, they had enemies all over the world, and they were going to see if they couldn't uh, clamp down on any arms and ammunitions being smuggled into us. And so the key to doing that was develop a strategy to shut down the major ports of America, and this is what they attempted to do. New York at the time was one of the largest ports in America, as was Charleston. Charleston was the jewel trading seaport in the south. And so they came up with a basic strategy to focus on controlling the major ports, invading from Canada, basically to divide New England if possible because they felt that the greatest number of re uh, rebels were located in the New England area and also basically attract loyalists, people who were loyal to Great Britain, who were not in sympathy with these rebels rebelling against the crown. And so as you can see here on the map, uh, General William Howe, Sir William Howe comes in here in July 1776 with about 30,000 troops, basically from Halifax. And in fact, he's coming in and he's basically going to try to capture New York. George Washington, who's now the new commander in chief of the basically the uh, fledgling Continental Army, which was called the, the Army of Occupation or the Army of Observation in, uh, in Boston, uh, he takes over in mid June. Uh, he's appointed the commander in chief by the Continental Congress and he moves south to try to be able to do something with uh, stopping the British from taking New York. And he loses quite a few battles. In fact, the British uh, chase Washington all the way down through New Jersey, and of course Washington was able, because he was a very good planner, of planning to have watercraft available to transport he and his men across the Delaware River into Pennsylvania. When Cornwallis, who was assigned by General Howe to pursue Washington, reached the river's edge, there were no vessels remaining, so he had to retreat and go back to Princeton to set up basically a base of operations and wait to see what Washington would do. Now, it's interesting that during this time, the British also had a strategy. Remember I said something about coming in invading from Canada? Well, Benedict Arnold, who had been wounded at Quebec, was returning back to the army and coming down through New York, and he realized, he on basic information and intelligence, he realized that the British were basically building a fleet to transport an army to come in behind Washington uh, in the summer of 1776 and trap him with Lord Howe and Generals Clinton. Also uh, in front of him, the idea was that uh, General Carleton would come in behind Washington and Washington would be trapped and the war would be over. So Arnold basically during the summer of 1776 decided to build what we consider to be, in many of us, uh, America's first navy. He built it off the banks of Lake Champlain, and in fact, one of the gunboats that was sunk, all the gunboats were sunk eventually or burned, uh, one of the gunboats that was sunk was in relatively good shape, but it was lay at the bottom of, the, uh, of Lake Champlain for many years and was finally raised from Lake Champlain in 1934, and it's now on display at the uh, Smithsonian Museum of American History in Washington, D.C. But because of Arnold's action of taking his six ships and taking on the entire fleet of the British uh, in Lake Champlain, he was able to delay that particular movement of the British coming in behind Washington and trapping them, and it's known as the Battle of Valcor Island, and you rarely hear about it. It's not even in American history books.
What uh, Arnold's actions did was basically allow Washington to eventually cross the Delaware River successfully, escape from New York, cross the Delaware River, and come back. And you see the famous painting there of Washington crossing the Delaware. And in fact, he was able to attack Trenton, scoot back across the river with his troops after that first major victory in, in December of uh, 1776, and then outmaneuver when Cornwallis was lured up to the river's edge, he outmaneuvered Cornwallis and went behind Cornwallis's army in a forced march to Princeton where Cornwallis left a lightly guarded supply depot. And there, in fact, Washington attacked the, the troops there and then went on up into the mountains basically for the winter. Now, bear in mind that the British are humiliated because of these victories of the Americans at Trenton and Princeton. As a result, they've got to do something. They really have to uh, smash this rebellion before it gets out of hand. So they came up with another strategy. Once again, since the first strategy of invading from Canada didn't work, they decided to come up with a, another basic strategy. This campaign strategy was once again invade from Canada and to divide the northern colonies because all the, all the commotion that was being done, most of it at the time, was being occurring basically in Massachusetts and New Jersey and New York areas. So they came up with a three-pronged strategy. This time, they would bring an army down the St. Lawrence River and into the, into the west to basically attack Fort Stanwix. That was commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Barry St. Ledger of the British Army. They'd also bring an army compa uh, uh, commanded by General Johnny Burgoyne from the north, and they would proceed down the Hudson River Valley and t towards Albany, and uh, they actually met resistance at Saratoga. Another army was to come up from the south, and that was to be commanded by General Howe. It was the three-pronged ass uh, assault, basically, to try to divide New England, and they'd all converge in Albany. By dividing New England, in fact, they would cut New England off from the rest of the colonies, and they would think that that would be a good step in the right direction to end the war. But that third army never made it to Albany. The reason for that, and never made it to Saratoga either, and the reason for that is simply because a strategy came up with uh, General Howe to basically capture the rebel capital at Philadelphia and the Continental Congress. So what Howe did was put 17,000 troops on ships, bring them down the Atlantic Ocean, up the Chesapeake Bay, drop them off at the head of Elk, and march 60 miles across land to try to capture Philadelphia and the Continental Congress. Well, the Continental Congress was gone. They, they skedaddled basically out of town to get away. But in fact, Washington, being in uh, Pennsylvania decided to try to defend the capital. And so he confronted the British at Brandywine Creek where he lost the battle. He had troops uh, also uh, commanded by Anthony Wayne that were attacked at a midnight attack at Paoli that's right near Brandywine Creek. He also lost a battle at Germantown and he gave up the forts at Mercer and Mifflin on the Delaware River that were basically guarding the Delaware to bring supplies that were basically holding the keeping the British from bringing supplies into Philadelphia during that winter. So once again, Washington is foiled, uh, trying to stop the British from occupying Philadelphia. Now, what was happening at Saratoga? Meanwhile, at Saratoga, you have that one lone army commanded by General John Burgoyne. And in fact, they were being surrounded by 15,000 American troops, militia primarily. And in fact, the American riflemen that were, that were there uh, were commanded by Daniel Morgan, who was now been paroled by the British, and he's now the commander of the, the American riflemen. And he's basically targeting British and Hessian officers on horseback. He killed the officers. The men do not have leadership to be able to guide them in their tactics. Also, uh, the Americans were fleeing for the Battle of Braven's Redoubt, which was on the, Ameri uh, the British right flank. It was on our left, and in fact, uh, our American troops were running away. There was an altercation and an argument between Benedict Arnold, who was uh, under General Gates. They didn't agree with one another. Arnold, in defiance, jumped on his horse, ran to the, the sound of the battle, saw that the men were in fact fleeing from the first attack or the first assault on Bremen's Redoubt, which was guarded by Hessians or allies to the British. And in fact, Arnold turned the battle around took Bremen's readout, won the Battle of Saratoga, that second battle, and in fact, when Gates wrote his report in, in giving full credit for victory, he assumed full credit for victory. He left Benedict Arnold and Daniel Morgan completely out of the report. Now, what did Saratoga do for us? Well, in fact, Saratoga really, uh, there, 
uh, history books and others, and many historians would have you believe that Saratoga was the turning point of the American Revolution. I unequivocally say that is not the case. Saratoga was not the turning point of the war. In fact, there wasn't any single turning point at all. In fact, France had jumped in with both feet, with the exception of troops, but they jumped in with both feet, uh, providing us with arms, ammunition, tents, uniforms, medicine, money, seven full months before Saratoga. In fact, Silas Dean, a delegate to the Continental Congress from Connecticut, was sent by Benjamin Franklin and others to negotiate basically an arms deal on credit. And this happened literally a whole year before uh, they actually began shipping goods to America. But France, by all means, committed very, very early to help us. In fact, Dean went over to France and he struck up a relationship with a gentleman by the name of Pierre Augustine Caron Beaumarchais. The Beaumarchais came from a watchmaking family, but he was a playwright. He wrote The Marriage of Figaro, The Barber of Seville, and The Guilty Mother. But he was also a very good advisor to King Louis XVI, and he was an arms dealer as well. So he really worked very closely to Silas Dean over a number of months to try to be able to line up significant smuggled goods that they could smuggle in, the arms and the ammunition and the tents and the uniforms and money that this fledgling American army would need. But they did not commit troops. That was something that Louis XVI did not want to do. He was still rebuilding his army and his navy that had been destroyed during the Seven Years' War, and so it was not the right time for France to commit troops. However, as it turns out, Franklin and Silas Dean were able, after the Battle of Saratoga, to negotiate two treaties, the Treaty of Amity and Commerce, which basically said that the 13 nation states would be recognized by France as a nation, and in fact, the Treaty of Alliance would say that France would come in and support the Americans in their effort to break away from Great Britain. So that treaty was based upon the relationship that Dean and Franklin had associated with basically Beaumarchais. Now, the first expedition, when, what, the, what that did, that treaty was allow basically French troops to be committed for the first time. Now bear in mind that already France had jumped in with both feet and they were supplying us with all the things we needed with the exception of troops. The Marquis de Lafayette and Johann de Kalb, his mentor, basically offered their services to the American cause for free in June of 1777. But when the French committed troops, after the treaty was signed in February of 1778, Admiral Comte d'Estaing arrived in April 1778 with 4,000 troops, but he had a tremendous amount of difficulty in working with American commanders and joining French and American troops side by side to fight the British. And in fact, uh, the first time was when, in fact, he tried to work with General John Sullivan in Rhode Island to try to retake Newport, Rhode Island from the British, and that failed miserably. Basically, a, a nor'easter came up the coast and, and dispersed the British and the French fleets, but even at that, the French troops were withdrawn from Newport side by side with the Americans, and in fact, Estang left and went down to the West Indies. He didn't come back for literally a year later. A year later, when in fact, General Benjamin Lincoln was trying to retake Savannah, Georgia from the British, De Stang was involved, and there actually De Stang got wounded. There were well, well over two or three hundred uh, French that were killed, but they could not work very well together. And once again, De Stang left. When he left, that was it. That's the, basically the track record is no wins and two losses in working with the French army trying to help the Americans. Well, if the Americans don't have someone like France to help provide them with troops in addition to the arms and the ammunition that France is already providing them, what do you do? Well, you have to train your own, and that's what Washington did basically at the muddy, uh, rainy, moderate winter at Valley Forge. All the pictures always show that it's a deep snowstorm at uh, Valley Forge that one winter that they stayed there. That simply wasn't the case. It was muddy, it was rainy, it was a very light winter. But Washington's challenge was to turn untrained, ill-equipped continental troops into a real fighting force, a professional fighting force. And to do that, Baron Steuben came over here, courtesy of the Rodriguez Hortalis company that Beaumarchais had set up by working with Silas Dean. It's Baron Steuben, it's not von Steuben. Von Steuben is referred to in history books, that type of thing. Steuben never used the name von, it was Baron Steuben. In fact, when he was signing letters, he always signed it just Steuben. It was, and he was re we referred to him as the Baron. It was not von Steuben. 
Well, in fact, they must have done a pretty good job in terms of training because when the British were vacating Philadelphia and marching back, not by sea, but going by land from Philadelphia to New York, Washington saw an opportunity. He felt he had to test his soldiers. And so at the Battle of Monmouth, which is basically at the Malapalane, which is midway through New Jersey, he decided to attack. Now, the British knew that that was going to happen. They were suspecting that Washington was going to attack the rear guard. And so they basically planted their main force uh, down the road a ways instead of 10 or 15 miles uh, away they were much closer to that rear guard so when Washington attacked the rear guard Generals Clinton and Cornwallis they were ready uh, and in fact the Americans did not run away in that battle in fact when the British counterattacked the Americans really gave them some hot fire with cannon and that in fact uh, General uh, Henry Knox who was the commander of the American artillery actually was able to get the British in a crossfire so that battle was fought to a draw but the British saw that the Americans could hold their own. Meanwhile, on the frontier in the West, basically Virginia Governor Patrick Henry was sending George Rogers Clark to the Northwest Territory and the Ohio Valley, which was claimed by Virginia uh, in modern day Illinois, Indiana and Ohio to basically put down basically Indian uprisings that were being encouraged by uh, Colonel Henry Hamilton, who was basically all along those areas was attacking American settlements of Americans, primarily Virginians who had moved across the Appalachians to settle in those areas. And there were major, major engagements at Kaskaskia, Cahokia, and Vincennes. But George Rogers Clark was sent by basically Patrick Henry to do that. And then of course he was able to capture uh, Henry Hamilton and bring him back to Williamsburg uh, to, for prison. Also in the West, people don't read about this very often, but the Spanish were involved. Now, they were allies of the French. They weren't allies of the Americans for a number of reasons. But Bernardo Galvez was Viscount of Galveston, and later he was Viscount of basically of New Spain, which is the Louisiana Territory. He was leading Spanish troops over the British and attacking British fortifications at Mobile, which is now in Alabama, of course, and Pensacola, Florida. And a lot of this was being done to enhance Spain's, uh, Spain's position of securing Florida and all the lands east of the Mississippi River, just as we wanted all the lands to acquire uh, from the Appalachians to the Mississippi. Spain, through its own efforts, were trying to uh, gain a foothold and gain all the land from the Mississippi to the Appalachians. So we are at odds right there. Uh, Spain also did not trust the expansion of these uh, nation states, these colonies, and they just were reluctant to embrace independence for the United States or these, these uh, nation states. And in fact, they also felt that it was also by embracing whatever we were doing would send the wrong message to their own colonies and their own colonies might think about rebelling as well. Now, also on the naval front, you had John Paul Jones among about four to 5,000 privateers who were attacking British supply convoys destined for America with their own arms, ammunition, tents, uniforms, money, medicine, that type of thing. And he was doing so in the English Channel and the North Sea. In fact, his most famous battle was with his Bonhomme Richard, which was basically a support uh, supply ship that was converted into a flagship with cannon uh, over his major victory was over the British warship Serapis in, at the, in the English Channel. And of course you see his famous quote there, I have not yet begun to fight. When you're a privateer, you're basically paid by the Continental Congress to attack foreign shipping or British shipping. Uh, if you're not paid, then you're a pirate. So basically the British campaign strategy by 1779 was beginning to shift. Because France and Spain had declared war on Great Britain, Britain was protecting its, basically, its colonies throughout the world and all of its possessions. So they began pulling troops out of North America to protect those areas. They were going to rely really on sympathizers, the loyalists that were loyal to Great Britain here in the colonies to try to fight the rest of the war for them. They had, they had a certain contingency of British troops, about 30,000 in New York alone. But the fact is, is they were really relying a lot on American loyalists to try to win the war. So they shifted their emphasis to the South. They had been unsuccessful in clamping down and destroying this attempt at rebellion in the mid-Atlantic colonies as well as in New England. So they shifted their attention to the South. You see some of the major battles there. There were really, really many, many more battles, skirmishes, that type of thing throughout the South. But they turned their attention obviously to the major port of Charleston. It was the jewel trading seaport in the South. And in fact, uh, it was the largest defeat of the American army 
uh, during the war. 5,600 troops were taken prisoner. In fact, it, the siege lasted just about a month. And in fact, uh, they had firm control of that seaport. By controlling seaports in the south, such as Savannah, Wilmington, and Charleston, the British were able to establish bases of operations along the coast and continue to provide their troops with the arms and the ammunition and the supplies that they needed to penetrate inland and be able to set up fortifications, fort after fort after fort, to be able to try to control and contain uh, the, the, the territory that was there. Well, if you have, lose a whole army in the south, you have to buy time for another army to be trained. So what emerged were partisan guerrillas. Partisan guerrilla warfare emerging primarily in South Carolina. Also a little bit in Georgia and North Carolina, but primarily in the back country of South Carolina. And the most famous one that we all can relate to is the Swamp Fox, Francis Marion. But there were other South Carolina partisan leaders too. The pro prominent ones were Thomas Sumter, the Carolina Gamecock, uh, Andrew Pickens was also from South Carolina, and Elijah Clark is little known, but he was from Georgia. He occupied most of the area along the Georgia-South Carolina border, and William Richardson Davy of North Carolina. There were many other partisans that were involved, but these were the prominent ones who really gathered individuals, uh, well-trained militia, I might add, every bit as well-trained as the Minutemen in in, uh, in the Massachusetts, and they used hit and run tactics basically to strike at the British outposts, garrisons, and supply lines throughout the South. And the whole idea was to buy time for another Continental Army to be trained to be able to confront Cornwallis and his troops, professional troops in the South. Now, the commander that was selected over Washington's uh, idea, by the way, was Horatio Gates, the so-called her uh, hero of Saratoga. Uh, really, Washington had wanted his, one of his top generals, Nathaniel Green, to take that position. Uh, he also wanted Henry Knox, but Knox demurred. He basically said, no, you should go with Green. So Green's name was put forward, but the Continental Congress decided to go with Horatio Gates. Gates basically came south and, in fact, picked a fight with Cornwallis. His troops were, many of them were untrained. He only had two real professional re regiments that had been well-trained, the Delaware and the Maryland troops under his command, under the command also of Johann de Kalb, and he picked a fight with Cornwallis, and in fact, he lost. Once again, the Americans are in a unique situation where they're up against the British, and it's very, very difficult. So, Johann de Kalb wasn't even told the fact that Horatio Gates, seeing that he was losing the battle, mounted his horse and rode 60 miles up to Hillsborough to basically get away. And de Kalb had a very, very courageous last stand at that stage. But after that humiliating defeat, the Americans bounced back at King's Mountain, a little-known battle that occurred basically on October 7, 1780. Now, Patrick Ferguson was the left wing, commanded the left wing of Cornwallis's army as Cornwallis began to new, move north from South Carolina into North Carolina and eventually to Virginia. His idea was to eventually turn off the spigot of French aid that was coming in the Chesapeake Bay to provide Americans with arms, ammunition, tents, uniforms, and money. So Patrick Ferguson basically threatened Areas across the mountain, the over mountain men, the people from what is now Kentucky, Indiana, uh, Ohio areas. And in fact, he threatened them in saying, if you do not come back across the mountains or submit to our British way of thinking, then I'm going to devastate you and also I'm going to destroy everything you had and I'll be threatening your families. Well, the over mountain men, John Severe, Isaac Shelby, James McDowell, Benjamin Cleveland, William Campbell, and a host of others basically said, no, we're not looking for that. We're going to come after you. And in fact, uh, he had 1,100 uh, troops at Kings Mountain. They all converged at once, and he was basically, not only was he killed, but uh, several hundred of his troops were also decimated as well. So that was a major, major, major turning point in the South. In fact, it pit Americans uh, loyal to Great Britain against Americans who were in favor of independence. And Patrick Ferguson, as I mentioned, was a, was a very, very smart, brilliant uh, British officer, but he met his demise at King's Mountain. So Nathaniel Green comes south at the end of the uh, December of 1780, and he's replacing uh, Horatio Gates. He's very, very brilliant as a strategist, and he lures Daniel Morgan out of retirement. They devise a very crucial strategy. The idea is that they're going to divide their forces to do foraging, uh, and also try to uh, get Cornwallis to come out of the city. 
and hopefully divide his forces as well. So that's exactly what they did. That's exactly what Cornwallis did. He fell for the trap. So he comes out and he, with his army and he pursues uh, Nathaniel Green. He sends Bannister Tarleton, his number one cavalry leader, after Daniel Morgan. Daniel Morgan lays a trap at the Cowpens in South Carolina on January 17th and destroys Bannister Tarleton's legion, made up of Americans who were fighting for Great Britain. And in fact, out of 1,100 troops, 900 are killed, wounded, or captured. Tarleton barely gets away with his life. Meanwhile, Green fights a weakened Cornwallis. He knows that after, after, basically after uh, Morgan and Green unite, they're on their way to try to find Cornwallis. They meet Cornwallis, who's really weakened at this point because he's lost his, his eyes and ears, his cavalry. He's also lost the entire left wing of his army at King's Mountain. So he's basically in a situation where he is very, very weakened. So basically Green fights Cornwallis to a draw. Uh, technically, uh, Green actually did a great job in defending his army, and in fact, uh, but the, he was the uh, the British left the field after the Americans, so they accorded like basically a, a, a draw, basically a victory to the British. But I think it was a draw. I think most people think it was a pretty good draw because of what Green did in holding his own. Basically, the French uh, were in a situation where they had not been successful with providing their troops. Lafayette was terribly embarrassed that, in fact, uh, that when he went over to England on a sabbatical, about a 16-month leave of absence, he saw that he had heard what had happened to basically the Stang, and he pleaded with the king to send another army. So the king decided reluctantly to do this. He was actually thinking of pulling the plug along with the Spanish and letting the Americans drift because they had not seen any significant wins in the American part. So in fact, the British king, uh, or the British, uh, excuse me, the, the French king, uh, Louis the Sixteenth, chose Rochambeau, who uh, above and beyond was one of the finest commanders of the entire American Revolution. Uh, he had worked with uh, uh, Comte de Grasse in rebuilding the army and the navy. And so in fact, uh, Rochambeau persuaded, after he arrived with his troops in Ju July of 1780, persuaded his troops uh, along, to f fight alongside Washington, and he convinced Washington to leave New York and come down to Yorktown to try to capture and, tra and trap Cornwallis. At that same time, uh, Admiral de Grasse was available. He was actually guarding the, the French uh, West Indies Sugar Islands, and he left those in possession of basically to be guarded by the Spanish fleet so he could come up to the Chesapeake Bay and hopefully entrap Cornwallis and cut off the reinforcement fleet that, that uh, Cornwallis needed to survive. So during the, there you see the Washington-Rochambeau route that, uh, that Washington and Rochambeau took from basically uh, New York and Rhode Island respectively all the way down to Yorktown and there you see the famous surrender, John Trumbull's a famous painting of the surrender of Cornwallis at Yorktown. Now, Yorktown was not the last battle of the war. Last major battle, but it was not the last battle of the war. War continued in the South in particular with battles and skirmishes throughout 1782. What Yorktown did was trigger peace talks, which were really, really crucial. Uh, the Treaty of Paris in 1783 actually ended hostilities, but the American ministers started to go through back channels because they had heard that the French and the British and the Spanish were working behind our backs. So uh, Franklin went to Virgins, the French minister confronted him with that and then began to work exactly with, in close cooperation with the British and a preliminary agreement was made in 1782. So in that agreement, the, the Americans got everything they wanted. They in fact uh, got all the land to the west of the uh, Appalachians to the Mississippi. You can see uh, those areas that became eventually territories and then states. And the 13 nations did acquire that new territory, but land disputes continued. Uh, we were 13 nations bickering among ourselves. The Northwest Ordinance resolved some of those things, but there you see Jefferson's plan for how the new states would be formed. And on the right there in the Northwest Territory, you see the states as they actually came into the Union much later. Now, under the Articles of Confederation, they were relatively weak, but it's what we wanted at the time. We were 13 nation states. We were not inclined to look upon ourselves as a nation. So we had no designated leader. We couldn't speak with one voice to trade with as all these uh, nation states as one nation with France or Spain or the Netherlands. Uh, we had no common currency. In the South, they wanted uh, Spanish currency. In Pennsylvania, they wanted Dutch currency. Uh, 
it, there, was any, there wasn't any cooperation among the states. We didn't have a common defense. We had no way of raise money or, or sustain an army or a navy from people who might attack us because each of the militias were uh, unto themselves in each of these nation states. So it was very, very cumbersome. And in fact, it came to a head uh, that in fact, uh, certain members of, of, of uh, the community at that time, Alexander Hamilton and George Washington and John Adams and others, John Dickinson, they all came together and said, we need something new, it's not working. And so they, began, they came together to adopt the new constitution. George Washington was in retirement, so they had to persuade him to come and chair because they knew that would be the only way that they could get all the colonies or the nation states that they called themselves now to be able to converge. And they did. In fact, um, in order to converge, they came up with a constitution uh, that was a draft. They had to send it to all the nation state legislators. And in order to convince the legislators to be become one nation any, with a federal constitution, they had multiple writers, uh, writers such as John Jay, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Dickinson, I might add, uh, even though the Federalist Papers that were pers to persuade the nation states to ratify the Constitution were predominantly uh, focused by the Federalist Papers of those three, John Dickinson also uh, single-handedly uh, sent out hundreds of publications as well uh, to, to local broadsides and newspapers. So he was intricately involved, but we don't talk about John Dickinson. He's been kind of left out of our history books. Well, they must have done something right because they were able to get the new constitution approved on September 17, 1787. And years ago, several years ago, United States Senator, former United States Senator Robert C. Byrd uh, proclaimed in legislation Constitution Day. That's what we celebrate in September 17th every year. It was ratified by 11 out of the 13 states, but it was implemented on March 4th, 1789. Even though the ratification occurred, George Washington did not become president of the United States and the new constitution until March 4th, 1789. That's when it took effect. So technically, the United States of America was born on March 4th, 1789. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. This, as I said, was a broad overview and an orientation of the American Revolution. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you see what was packaged in the 26 years of our American Revolution. Thank you once again for the Hampton Museum for providing me this opportunity to give you this very brief overview. Thank you. Thank you very much, Randy. Uh, we do have a couple of comments and a question. Uh, to uh, let me uh, scroll down to Catherine and Kathleen. Yes, we are recording this. So you will be able to find it uh, uh, on our Facebook feed and uh, on our, ultimately on our uh, website as once Seamus has had a, a chance to digest it. Uh, the question, I think a very, and you, I think you hinted on it a bit, um, is uh, uh, concerning the British priorities. Uh, a question about uh, were the British more concerned with their uh, issues in India than with their American colonies? Certainly after war broke out between France and Spain, when France and Spain, when they joined to fight the British, the British were very concerned about their possessions around the world and there was intense activity in India. Uh, troops were being redeployed from America all over the world. Uh, I did mention that, that the redeployment did occur. So I wouldn't say that necessarily India was uh, more important than the colonies, but I really, if you think about it, a lot of warfare, naval warfare went on uh, historically in the West Indies, uh, where uh, Britain was very interested in capturing the Sugar Islands uh, from a pure economic standpoint. So they were constantly doing battle with the French fleet and the Spanish in trying to capture those sugar islands. So I would consider that to be even a, more of a priority than India. But they, it was a worldwide war and Britain is very desperately trying to maintain control. So India was a, was a priority, no question about it. There's no single priority in terms of England's efforts to try to hold on to their, what was beginning to be their empire. All right, well, very good. Thank you so much, Randy. I've, I've learned a lot. Um, the French businessman who was an arms dealer poet. Beau Marche. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I've yeah. got to do some more digging on that fellow. He sounds fascinating. I should, I should know more. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we are virtual, as you well know. Uh, hopefully, in the coming uh, weeks, we will be able to uh, invite you back into our great hall here in person.
So thank you again for joining us. Uh, we will continue on uh, doing this virtually. And uh, uh, thanks again from the Hampton History Museum. <laughs>